There's an art to stealing art, but it's not what you think it is. Whoever stole the Picasso, the Matisse, the Braque, Modigliani, and the Leger from the Paris Museum of Modern Art, leaving only these frames behind, may have pulled off the biggest art heist ever, total value over a hundred million dollars, by simply snipping a lock and breaking a window. There was no high-tech alarm system to foil, it was broken, awaiting a part. Art theft can be mundane and not that clever. Ask Charlie Hill, retired cop. No, that's the dumb nut approach. Hill should know. Hill recovered the screen. Yesterday, uh, the two most uh, famous ones, they were stolen. Really? <gasps> On a dark February night in Oslo in 1994, while the rest of Norway was watching the Winter Olympic Games in Lillehammer, four men in what looked at times like a Keystone cop operation climbed up a ladder and stole a version of the famous painting. They left a note saying, thanks for the poor security. As an American working as a Scotland Yard detective, Hill posed as the man from the Getty, an art buyer from the LA Gallery, which cooperated with a British and Norwegian police sting operation that retrieved the artwork and nabbed the crooks. You were posing as a, as a buyer. Mid-Atlantic accented, dodgy art dealer. <laughs> there are more than a few. Hill will tell you the art thieves he's dealt with, and there are more than a few of them too, often don't live up to their billing. The guy thinks he's cunning and, and he's made his money in drugs and prostitution rings and all the kinds of it's car theft, yeah. all the sort of things he's made his money in. Now he's into trophy art crime, and that's what these guys are like. But is it as profitable? Or, it's, or it may be more dangerous? I think given the sentences these guys get and the fact that nobody's going to buy the stuff from them on the open market, it's, a, it's the dumbest thing they can do. Stealing a work of art is a lot like buying a new car. As soon as you take it out of the showroom, it depreciates by as much as 90%. So that's been recovered. Right. This and is one of the reasons. We have 180,000 stolen and missing items on the database. Julian Radcliffe's business is keeping tabs on the world's stolen art. There's plenty of it. There are 1,000 stolen Picassos on the database. 1,000 stolen, stolen Picassos. Picassos. 40, if you want. A piece comes onto the market somewhere, and an auction house or potential buyer can check it here to see if it's hot. Those who steal the art won't put them up for public sale. They sell them to fences and low-grade dealers of dubious reputations, mm -hmm. who will then try and sell them privately, either to unwitting collectors or to other dealers, and they will avoid them going into the auction houses. But sooner or later, the people who've bought them, perhaps who didn't know they were stolen, may offer them for sale in an art fair or in an auction house, and we then have a very good chance of finding them. But the stolen art sometimes has another use, as a money laundering device. If criminals, say drug dealers, can't move large sums of cash around for payment, they can move works of art. It becomes a kind of currency. It's a, a way of moving, as it were, a relatively large value around the world at a time when... In small packages. In, small pa in portable packages, when the banks are looking very carefully oh. for any extraordinary movements of cash or of international money transactions. So it's easier, for example, to take a million dollar picture from country A to country B than it is to move a million dollars any other way. Or the art is used as collateral for debts. Occasionally, it's ransomed back to the museum from which it was stolen. Rarely is it what we imagine it to be. Famous works stolen to order for shady people to hang in their private collections. The first thing to do is to put out of your mind anything by Jules Verne about Captain Nemo's wardroom covered in these stolen masterpieces, or Ian Fleming's Dr. No or Mr. Big saying, I want that Rembrandt, go steal it for me, and I'll sit here looking at it in my private uh, subterranean cavern palace type place. No. Um, it's, it's too risky for them. I mean, you know, somebody's going to tell them that, they, that it's been seen and, and that's the way it works. Mm. I mean, there's no, there's no honor among people like that. Even with the current recession caused crash in art prices, there are still big new money collectors in Russia and Asia, and art remains tempting. Not that long ago at this London auction, this Picasso went for more than $8 million. This Degas, 
26 and a half million. And this money, a staggering $80 million. With prices like these, artwork becomes a pretty attractive target, especially when compared to other kinds of wealth. Part of its value comes from its exposure, and its exposure makes it vulnerable. The art thieves, though, are going about it the hard way. There are subtler and easier ways to make an illicit killing in the art market. The fraudsters, the fakers, the guys that give you bogus attributions and make up provenance and all of that sort of thing. Now that's where people make money in the art world, as far as criminals are concerned. And as for those second story men who stole the monk. And what they really need to do is go back to school, get an education, do a bit of art history and become a, a dealer and, and a dodgy one at that. That's where they'll make money. Maybe Monk's figure isn't screaming at all. Maybe it's laughing.